I've always been fascinated by Malaysia because food is at the heart of the country's culture. That is amazing. To find out what makes this cuisine so unique, the flavour and the aroma is really rich and strong. I can eat that all day long. I'm embarking on a journey of culinary discovery. This is the best curry shop I've ever seen in my life. I want to uncover the secrets of Malaysia's rich and diverse cooking styles. The noise of everything! Add flavour! <laughs> and use everything I've learned on my travels to help you transform your home cooking. This is my Malaysian adventure, and I think it's going to be spectacular. Penang has the impressive honour of having been crowned the food capital of Southeast Asia. It's a state lying on the northwestern coast of the Malaysian Peninsula. With so much food culture on offer, I just had to return for another portion. This time, I explore more of the incredible variety of cuisine to be found here. Pigeons, quails, fish. I mean, you have pots and pots and pots of food. A local chef amazes me with a sensational snack. The pork is really moist, with fire spice running through it. It's fantastic. And I'll show you just how easy it is to cook simple Malaysian food for yourself. This dish is what I like to call a one-pot wonder. Ask almost any Malaysian where the best place is to sample their cuisine, and the answer is likely to be Penang. The town's fast emerging as a pilgrimage site for any serious foodie. And the vibrant street food culture of its capital, Georgetown, is a culinary kaleidoscope, reflecting Malaysia's ethnic makeup of Chinese, Malay and Indian. I want to find inspiration from all of Penang's different cultural influences. But today's excursion begins in a food market with a distinctly Indian heritage, where I'm meeting local guide Chandra Supia. Chandra. Hello, John. Nice to meet you, John. How are you? Good. What is this place? What is this, this area? This is called Little India. But this special place is only on the fasting month, Ramadan month. These stores are open for takeaways. If a person's fasting, they come to these markets and buy their food? How does it work? Depending on what they want, they just come and walk past, they take away and take it back. But they can't eat them until the sun goes down? Yes, until the break taking off fast. And everybody who's working on these markets? Are, are Muslims. And they're fasting as well? Yes. I find the discipline amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's go and have a look. Let's go and see what's... Come, let's go have a look. Okay. Some of our local delights. Hello. The smell. <laughs> the smell is incredible. Spice. Mm. But spice of India. And I'll go tease something. What I've realised I've gone around Malaysia is the different styles of food that happen. And Malaysian food, to me... It's a mixture. Yes, such a mixture. But when there is dried spice in it, it points me to one place, and that is India. Mm. If it's non-new cuisine, it's all fresh and no spices. But when it comes to Indian food, you can smell the dried cumin, the dried coriander, the turmeric. For miles away, you can smell it, yes. And that's why when you come to Little India, your nose leads you. My, my appetite leads me. Forget my nose. Come on. Tell me about the stall. What's this stall? Roti canai with murtabak. Means mutton meat with onions. But and tell me about roti chennai. What's roti, roti chennai? Normal plain wheat flour. And they knead it with some uh, butter or margarine. And they leave it for one, one night. So you make a sort of lamb egg patty first. Yes. And then you roll out the dough. Then you put this patty on top, fold it over. And just cook the first layer of roti tanai. I wish I could do that. That's pretty impressive, actually. It takes a long time skill to be able to throw it without breaking it. He does this, serves the customers, takes the money, does everything himself. Yes. And he's fasting. Very, and he's fasting. Unbelievable. Yes, oh, tell me about this. What, what's behind you here? This fisherman's net pancake. It goes well, normal flour. With a uh, bit of egg into it, for it to be a bit sticky uh, as a dough, and then you grill it. And, and it goes well with either chicken curry or uh, beef curry. And so, what's it called? Roti jala. 
Jala means neck. So a fisherman's neck. It's very crispy. Say bassin ball. Prawn flitters, bean curd flitters. Then also another type of bone fritter with peanuts and also another bit. 100% prawns. Like a fritter, a donut. Yes. But with prawns and peanuts. Yeah. These are the basic. And people want extras, you know, like fish ball, tofu, potato, and some of the curds, bean curds. Do you serve it with a sauce or a salad? Yes. The salad is there, cucumber and cucumber, and the special homemade sauce. Wow, I've never seen anything like this. Are these traditional for Ramadan, or are they served all the other old times here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chandra's shown me plenty of Indian-inspired ideas to use in my own recipes. So it's time to move on to some of the other cultural influences in Penang. I'm visiting renowned local chef and author Pearly Key, who's going to show me an easy Malaysian snack with a distinct Chinese flavour. Oh, hi, hey, John. Hi, Pearly. How are you? Good, good, good. Come into my house. Come, Thank come, come, much. come. What are we going to cook? We're going to cook a uh, five-spice pot roll. This is only one of its kind. It's only done for celebration. The secret to making very nice pork roll, tenderloin pork, yeah? This has already been cut by the butcher in strips like this. So you need to blanch this first. And we'll just drop this into, yes, into drop the hot it water? In. That's right, drop it in. So this is pork fat, which we're going to blanch. Yeah, so while you're deep frying, the pork fat will release more oil and cook the fat inside. OK, so while that is going on, you have to do something, yeah, yes. for marinating this pork. So I need the garlic to be really chopped fine. Garlic in. in. Uh -huh. Along with the garlic goes spring onions and water chestnuts chopped into matchsticks. You don't want it too thin because you cannot bite onto the texture. OK. Yeah. So we're going to turn off the heat now, just about five minutes, and then we take it up. I'll put it back in the little bowl. So in here, the bowl now, we yeah. have chopped garlic and spring onions. Yeah, mix it all well first. And our water chestnuts yes. and our pork mixture, yeah? Yeah. Ready for adding all the seasoning. Half a teaspoon. Pepper, sugar, salt, five spice powder, dark soy. You can't put too much. You don't want it to be too dark, yeah? So just enough to give a nice colour, like soya sauce. So while we are doing this, we add the pork the lard, okay. the blanched lard, yeah? You add it in. Yeah. Once you mix it well, this is potato flour. Yes. So we're going to add this in to bind well. And then mix, mix it together? together. Yeah. I'm now going to take the tofu skin and show you how we do the pork roll. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to wrap it in with this bean sheet. Oh, bean curd skin. Yes. Well, look at that. Yeah. It's very, very soft. How, how do they make it? So they cook the tofu and then they let it coagulate and they harvest it sheets by sheets. Yeah. So it's, it, it's really, it's the same as the skin on somebody's porridge and they lift it off with a piece of paper yes. and then they peel off, then it sits and then it dries and then they peel the paper That's off. That's right. Yeah. Now we're ready to wrap our pork mixture in the bean curd skin. This is what you do. And then you taper it in. And that's it. Finish. And cut the roll. Okay. Done. All right, how about it? We're going to deep fry. That looks amazing. Ah. So, John, I'll show you. This is how we do it. Put it in. Don't throw. Yeah, slowly release. If yes. you throw, all the oil will hit on you. All of them? Yes, all of them. It feels so delicate. No, it's all right. That's right. Ah, you got very nice, steady hands. Very good. Don't burn yourself, yeah? Only when it's cooked, it lifts itself up. It floats the top? Yeah, it just lifts itself up. So you can also know because it changes colour here. Now it's ready to be taken out. OK, done. Yeah? So how do we wait, cut it? I can't wait to see what's inside. You cut it this way. You saw like that, and then saw again. Like, traditionally, we love to cut it 
in a bite size. So you can see the texture. It looks like a little sausage. Mm. And then this is what we do. Oh. It might be hot, but it's just delicious. There's, you can taste garlic spraying in, the water chestnuts, the pork is really moist, a bit of fire spice running through it, a little bit of salty soy sauce. It's fantastic. Mm. I think you're ace. Thank yeah. you very Thank much you very indeed. Much. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. We came to Gloucester because we're fishing against the best of the best. We all want to take the veterans off their throne. They have no idea what's coming. They really don't. We can't just let them roll in and outfish us. We cannot let them beat us in our own arena. Every fish matters. We're defending our territory. They're afraid. I know they are. Wicked Tuna, next on National Geographic. When you build a bridge, we always thought of ourselves as being part of the environment rather than an alien object being introduced into the area. So we made our bridge a little bit longer to minimize as much as possible the impact on the mangrove ecosystem. In 2018, construction of a mangrove propagation and information center began in Cordoba. And I hope it will be successful in mangrove conservation and make an impact to the community. Mangroves have two general functions that are important. The seafronts where you get the first landfall of storms. So they provide coastal protection. These mangroves also have an important fisheries function, vital to the livelihoods of fisher folk. Ang tanang dagat sa Cordoba na tuyok na nanamo. So ito na mayana, bisan o gabi eh. Importante po na ko ang pagpangisda kay Monay na kapiskwila sa ko sa akong mga bata. Namin sila gihimo nga Fisherman's Bridge na mawi agianan sa tanang mangingisda para makapangisda lang gihapon. Nagkatrabaho pa man sila pero total kung mahuman na daghan naman sa dang makapahimo so malipay na kung mahuman. So ang akong buhaton mao nga na kadadlaw na ako kanunay sa dagat. Mahuman na ang Maong Bridge. Makaduga nga sa turista nga maabot din sa among isla o barangay Ilotongan. Magkatabang niya po sila. Kaya dagang nga barang. Dua anak na to. The bridge is symbolic in many respects. You are connecting people, you are connecting culture, and you are connecting communities. Simba, look at the stars. One day, the sun will rise with you as the new king. My father once told me to protect everything the light touches. You have to take your place as king. Remember who you are. The Lion King premieres May 24th, only on Fox Movies. Palaces, the most spectacular and lavish homes on Earth. Behind the golden gates of these royal megastructures are incredible stories of infamous monarchs from history. It's an amazing moment of history when you think that Mozart would have met Marie Antoinette there. And the artists and engineers who turned their grand visions into a reality. One of the most dramatic cascades ever constructed. World's Greatest Palaces, Wednesday nights at 9 on National Geographic. Every Monday to Friday, starting from 2.20 p.m., we're bringing you the best of Nat Geo. Got him on! Goes bang. This is a huge snake. I'm about to go into the Maya underworld. Entertain your brain while you're at home with Best of Nat Geo. Monday to Friday, starting from 2.20 p.m. on National Geographic. I'm back in Penang's capital, Georgetown, where I'm sampling more of the eclectic blend of tastes and flavours of its street food. And my guide, Chandra, tells me there's one stall that has to be seen to be believed. So tell me about this. This is chicken biryani. It's a specialty, very filling. They have two types, with just white rice 
of granny rice. I like a biryani. The rice and all the meat is cooked together to make a biryani and all the spices. And it all puffs up, doesn't it, one big pot. But as for the rest of it, I have no idea what's here. Can I have a look in here, please? Aubergines. Aubergines. Liver. Liver. The goat liver. Goat intestines. Ah, uh, this is mutton. OK, that's obviously fish. Ah, uh, that's fish. Uh, oh, it's quails. Quills, yes. Yes. It is quail. Quail curry. Quail curry. Now, there's an inspiration. Yeah. Also, we have pigeon. Pigeon as well. Pigeon, yeah. Smaller than quail. This is the best curry shop I've ever seen in my life. Pigeons, quails, fish, chicken of various amounts, biryani rice, white rice, and just the speed of doing it at. It's just, it's baffling. I mean, you have pots and pots and pots of food. Got goose turkey, huh? Goose and turkey. How long does it take you to make all this curry? We start at uh, 7.30. We'll finish uh, nearly at uh, 11.30 at 2 o'clock. And you're fasting as well? Yes. So you're getting up at 7.30 in the morning, making all this food, you're fasting all day, serving in this heat. I, I, I say to you, I have greatest respect, absolutely greatest respect. All I want to do is sit here all day and eat the whole lot. But as it's Ramadan, I'm not going to do that. Wow. Back in the UK, I've come to Manchester's Chinatown to meet Chef Norman Musa. Using authentic Malaysian ingredients that are now widely available here, he's going to show me how to make one of his favourite dishes from his hometown, Penang. So, Norman, we've got some ingredients. Yeah. Tell us what we're making. We're going to be cooking this wonderful dish called rendang. Tell us what rendang is. What's well, rendang is a dry curry, and you can cook with, either with beef or chicken, or I've tried it with uh, as a vegetarian as well. It works very well. We begin by preparing some ingredients for a spice paste. Shallots, fresh turmeric, lemongrass, garlic, ginger and galangal, along with a few dried chilies soaked in hot water. But let's do like a make it very Malaysian because this is going to make your curry look very red. Now for a few dried spices. Coriander, cumin, fennel, peppercorns, cardamom pods, cinnamon bark and star anise. So we got all these beautiful spices, we're going to toast them and we're going to turn it into powder. Using coffee grinder. Another ingredient I'm going to add in. Blachan. Yeah, blachan, that's it, the shrimp paste, OK? And now we're ready to cook. Goody. OK, now this is uh, one of the key ingredients for rendang, OK? Uh, we call karisi, roasted coconut. While the block of coconut cream melts, Norman adds our blended paste to some oil infused with lemongrass, cardamom pods, cinnamon bark and star anise. This stage, what you need to do is cook this until the oil is separated. OK? When I say the oil is separated, it started doing now. Next, Norman adds palm sugar, diced top side of beef and finally coconut milk and then leaves it all to simmer for around 45 minutes. The melted coconut crisse is only added at the very end. If you add it right at the beginning, uh, it's going to take away all this flavour. Along with some chopped lime leaves. And then now it's ready to serve. It's delicious. <laughs> Norman's massively amazing Manchester Malaysian <laughs> rendang. See, now that proves wherever you're around the world, I mean, there's no stopping from you cooking such a delicious and authentic rendang. Penang had masses of delicious and authentic Malaysian food to inspire me. But I want to show you my take on one particular dish I saw that blew my mind. So back to my own kitchen, and I'm going to be making Malaysian quail curry. This recipe is inspired when I was walking through the Ramadan markets with Chandra, and there was a stall which I think had around about a tonne 
of curry on it, and one pot was full of extraordinary quails. Now, quail curry is a lovely, lovely thing. It's just about getting the paste right and bringing it together to make it this lovely, sweet, luscious, fragrant Malaysian curry. First up, it's all about the quails. Quails, I think, are completely underrated. We eat lots of chicken, we eat pheasant, we eat partridge, but we don't eat very much quail. And I think these little beauties are a great, great thing. You take one, serve one, pull it apart, sweet meat, fantastic. It's just about cooking them right. In this pot, I've got some onions which are sticky and brown, and I'm gonna add to that a curry paste. This curry paste is gonna be made up of all the ingredients I saw. And the great thing is, they're all available here. Chopped shallots, chopped galangal or grated ginger, chopped lemongrass, chopped garlic, powdered turmeric, ginger which I've soaked in water to take away the harshness, the bitterness that ginger can sometimes bring to a dish. It can be a little bit ferocious and a little bit too hot, so I've just taken that out a little bit just to mellow it and keep the ginger flavour subtle. Then, some dried chilies which have been soaked in hot water. Lid on and give it a whiz. To these fragrant aromats, I'm going to add a very, very important Malaysian ingredient, and that is toasted black chan, toasted shrimp paste. It is the seasoning of Malaysia. It gives things the salty, fragrant flavour that I associate now with Malaysia. Toasted in foil, the shrimp paste comes alive. It becomes biscuity. Add to that souring agent, which is tamarind water, and gula malaka, palm sugar individual to malaka in Malaysia because it's made from coconut palm. So it's coconut palm sugar, and it's darker and it's more caramel than most palm sugar. Here we go. That now sits to one side. I'm gonna take my onions out of here. This dish is what I like to call a one-pot wonder. Into our pot, 100 grams of ghee. And ghee is just clarified butter. Ghee gives it a real richness. And of course, there's the Indian influence that's coming in here from Malaysia. If you're going to cook birds, poultry especially at home, it's important they're seasoned. But don't season them on the outside, the skin uh, is a protective cover for the flesh. So you season the inside. Salt inside each one of these quails. Quails go into a pot and they cook and seal on both sides. It takes about five to six minutes. So now we've got these quails. A bit of movement, a bit of noise, a bit of colour. Just enough to seal the skin. They come out, keep the pot nice and hot. It doesn't matter about the onions that are left in the bottom, if there are some left. And in there goes my paste. Whoa! And give it a really good stir. Now, this paste needs to cook. It needs to cook down really well. Just take its time, let it cook down. And what happens is it's the smell that changes as much as the colour. The colour will go from that very, very vibrant bright yellow that you can see from the turmeric to more of a toasted golden brown. And that is the turmeric and all the spices and all the aromats cooking together. Add to this curry leaves. I love curry leaves. I've never used them so much as I have now that I've returned from Malaysia and they're available everywhere. And then my quails, back into the paste. Cover the quails now with the onions. Sprinkle over some flour, which will thicken it, and then give the whole thing a really good stir. Everything in one pot, just beautiful. The colors, the smell, it's bejeweled with curry leaves and chilli and golden turmeric. 
add to our pot of curry now and our quail. It's chicken stock. You made from stock cube. All I want is that the quails are covered with liquid. Stir the whole lot together. Already, at this stage of the cooking, they look fantastic. And as soon as it comes up to the boil, lid's going to go on and then it'll simmer for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, simmering away those four little quails in there. And there we have it. The sauce is thickened and it's just fantastic. Curry leaves, onions, spices, and the meat's just starting to fall off the bone. Something inspired by the streets of Malaysia, which I think looks amazing, but tastes even better.